the culminating craft and art of film is the edit. How do you get in and out of the, that mindset? But you know, editing's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you don't need to say anything. I know everything I needed. <laughs> yeah. And then just like, I can get to work. I think it, there's a lot of value in, in recognizing that. I don't prescribe to the Rick Rubin. You don't think of your audience when you're making something. <laughs> Whatever's going on outside those doors is its own thing. And that can either be yeah. incredibly exciting or incredibly heartbreaking. There's a lot more we could talk about. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm Colton Holmes. And today I'm your host on The Rough Draft. In this episode, I sit down with Lucas Harger, an acclaimed film and commercial editor, supervising editor, and partner at Bruton Strobe Outpost. His client work features brands such as Nike, Amazon, Apple, and Disney+. And his documentary portfolio includes work on over 10 features, two of which recently made their debut at South by Southwest. Lucas's intentionality is incredibly contagious and apparent from the moment you begin talking with him. He and I talk about that intentionality and how it helps position him as a storyteller and collaborator with directors. We also chat about his editing mindset and philosophy that set him, his team, and his work up for success with each project. All right, here's my conversation with Lucas Harger. All right, Lucas. So since we started concepting the rough draft, I've been super excited to have someone in post-production join the show. And so whenever we got the opportunity to bring you um, on as a guest, I jumped at that and I've been looking forward to today ever since um, I saw your email. And so first of all, just thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to be here and to bring post-production to the rough draft. That's right. Let's show uh, some editors some love today. Yeah. Um, so actually a few years ago, I watched your interview with Film Supply where um, you just yeah. kind of dig into how you find inspiration in poetry and how you connect that to, you know, cutting film. Um, yeah, for sure. And I think like the world and the internet, you know, is curating things for us a lot. And so mm-hmm. sometimes I think just going back to like some analog or just like some something that we can just physically, you know, feel and touch and read and yeah, for curate sure. on our own is just really important. Yeah, absolutely. No, I told, I mean, and I think like, you know, looking for inspiration for your craft outside of your craft, I think you can get really siloed on the internet and just go down rabbit holes of editing tutorials or gear tutorials or unboxing stuff. And so you, you can, you can start to just silo your inspiration just based on what your specific craft is, but pulling in, um, pulling in outside inspiration from poetry or from, um, you know, you know, reading fiction, nonfiction, going to the muse, you know, going to museums, going to art museums, you know, just looking for inspiration outside of your craft will always inevitably pour itself back into your craft. And so for me, I find a lot of just inspiration, whether aesthetically or even even rhythmically through poetry. And so, yeah, I think expanding and kind of curating your own uh, your own feed, if you will, is definitely um, is definitely an important part. Yeah, no, I think that's so wise. So like editing's always been the aspect of production that, you know, I've always felt most comfortable with. Um, and it's like where my passion kind of just like grew its legs. And um, it's the thing that I always just kind of go back to. If like, if I'm feeling insecure on like any yeah. part of production, editing is always where I get my confidence back. And so I just kind of want to talk about like, how do you approach taking on that responsibility of like, mm-hmm. you have so much power once that, once that project hits, hits your plate. Um, yeah. so how do you like honor what, you know, the original, um, may, maybe vision was for the project, but also how do you infuse and inject your voice and your style into, into projects? For sure. I think a lot of it, I mean, just inherent in the question all points to collaboration and usually with the director, there's other projects that have other voices that you collaborate with as an editor, but that director editor relationship is really a, a sacred one, you know, and it's the reason why. You have you can look through and find all of these top directors working with the same editor for years. Um, like my favorite would be in the scripted world. My favorite would be like Denis and Joe Walker um, working on all of the film from Dune to Arrive. I mean, they've just been jamming together for a long time because they start to understand each other's sensibilities and they yeah. start to understand each other's language and they can like fall into a rhythm very quickly. And so for me, it's you've started that conversation, that collaboration. And you've started to already impact the production and the storytelling and the capture before footage even hits my desk. And so sometimes that's the case. There's zero footage and we're having a lot of conversations leading up 
to production. Um, but then there's also times where I'll get brought into a project that's like, you know, 60% of the way through production. And then I get a chance to watch all of the footage. And then I get a chance to start to infuse my thoughts and to yeah. infuse my I'm um, like where I see the story kind of developing and especially in documentary, um, there's just so much constantly developing and taking shape. And so for me, once the footage hits my desk, we're kind of already on the same wavelength yep. of creative collaboration. And then we can dive in and start and then I can dive in and start cutting it with the vision of the director at the forefront of my mind, but also willing to pivot when something starts to arise in the footage Um that they didn't see that, you know, I wasn't expecting that nobody really foresaw, but it's a really unique cinematic opportunity that we definitely can't let go. And so I think it's the good editor, the great editor that can take in, you know, outside inspiration, like we were talking a little bit ago, that can take in direction and vision from the director, but they can, they can also be open to letting creativity enter the edit suite and to create something wholly unique that nobody could have really foreseen before getting into it. And that's when like, you know, you feel like you're now not just making a video, you're making a film, you yeah. know, and you just start throwing things on the timeline. And then once the screen starts vibrating, it's like, all right, there's something here. And then you can just keep pulling that thread and just keep chasing it as an independent editor, but then also as uh, an, an editor and director collaboration, a duo, you're just like, this is definitely revealing itself as the path forward. And so, you know, it gets to the point where really great ideas are manifest in the timeline. And you're just like, I don't remember doing that. Do you remember having that? Idea? No, I don't remember having that. It's like a third <laughs> party has been entered in. It's just like, how did that great moment happen? It's like, I don't know. It's like, you start to not take any responsibility for anything. It's just like, this thing is just like starting to like cut itself in a lot of ways. And so like being open to that kind of mode of operation and that collaboration um, yields way better results than people coming in with, especially in the doc world, coming in with definitive declarations of yeah. exactly what this film is. Yeah. And that's a big red flag to me when I'm talking to potential director um, collaborators. It's like, if you are so incredibly sure of what this film is, uh, then I'm not the cutter for you. That's not really, yeah. you know, my thing. So, you know, I think it's just that openness, that being willing to collaborate, collaborate often and early. You know, if you get a whole load of feature length documentary footage dropped on your desk uh, and that's the first time you've talked to the director, you're probably in a little for a little bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> yeah. How do you find the right story? Like what's what's like the one the one process or the one philosophy that you always use and that you always go back to? I'm starting at point A. The story is somewhere over there. Like. What's your, yeah. what's your, what's your attack? You, sometimes the film is, you know, very linear. And so you kind of have a concept of where it is, but even with a linear film, there's a lot of opportunity to get, you know, more, more abstract. So, so for me, the story starts to reveal itself or I put a lot of weight on that first watch as an editor, watching down all the footage is the most important practice um, in the in the process, I think. And because you, you're starting to identify things in the footage that make you as the uh, as the blessed first audience, the true first audience. I mean, honestly, a lot of times even the director hasn't seen everything, which yeah. is obvious because they're, you know, especially if it's a multicam shoot, they're like over here and this is happening over here and they don't have time to yeah. watch down the foot, you know, whatever. So a lot of times, I'm either the first or the only one to have seen everything. And so being that first audience, paying attention to what is making me respond emotionally or viscerally or, you know, looking through the hundreds of hours of footage and identifying what are those key moments that are that are just like, wow, like that's that's incredible. Like that's a story. You know what I mean? Like identifying those. And then it's the process of like packaging all that up, and making those moments as poignant and powerful as we can through cutting, through music, through sound design, through color, through all of the tools that we have, and then packaging them all up and presenting them to the second audience. Um, and so, which is the true audience, the real audience, you know? And so for me, it's keeping that in mind, keeping in mind the audience. I, you know, he has his, he has his reasons, but I don't, prescribe to the Rick Rubin. You don't think of your audience when you're making something, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, so that's, that's how I kind of start from an emotional standpoint. And you obviously have, you know, you obviously have 
things you have to do. You have context you need to get down. You have to get from A to B to C. Yeah. And then it's like, what's the most poetic, artful, um, compressed, con consolidated, information-rich way we can kind of pivot through these things so that we can start setting up the next thing that's going to really pay all of this off. Yeah. And so, you know, that that's, that's how I approach it. it. All It all starts with, you know, washing down all of the footage and being very diligent yeah. in washing down all of the footage. Yeah. Which can be an exhausting thing to do sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, editing's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Have there ever been moments where maybe you look back on a project and you realize, hey, I was feeling this certain way in this time whenever I was cutting this together and, you know, now maybe a couple of years removed, I can see how that influenced how I cut it. And maybe now, you know, I would have cut it a little differently if, if I was feeling the way I'm feeling today. Um, do you see like a connect between like, man, maybe things that are going on in your life or like um, some things that you're feeling and how that translates into maybe and in, without mm. even knowing it, how that translates into how you have cut something? I, I mean, I don't know about the, I, I I can see how, I mean, I, every cut I look back on, I'm like, I would do it a little bit differently now. Sure. Um, you know, there's always things, you know, I don't know where this quote came from, but films are never finished. They're just abandoned. And so there's always stuff you wish you could go back and continue to work on and hone in and dial in. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think the thing that it, it is the other things happening in life that can manifest themselves in the edit more so from like a, I would like a workload or business standpoint. I'm not sure if I've ever necessarily considered like my emotional state at that point having played it, uh, an impact. I think I can see the inspirations of the media or the um, my feed, what I had curated for myself, what I was reading, yeah. what I was listening to, what I was watching, what I was looking at. I could see those things showing up in the timeline and I may do them. I may cut a little differently now because I have different inputs in my life and those are showing up in the way that ways that I'm cutting. And, and ideally, you know, when a film hits and you start to identify what the state of the film, the emotional landscape and texture, I start to curate things around that, you know, adding yeah. things to the word cloud that surround that topic, that theme, especially if it's something that I don't know very much about. Like historically, I'll read a few books, kind of yeah. catch up on, on this and then start, you know, I, I cut a feature doc on, um, cowboys and you know other than just like basic cowboy knowledge so I read a couple books about cowboys but then also started to read a bunch of cowboy poetry and like started to step out so it's like finding things within the universe of your project to start inputting yeah. and so you know I tried I tried to manip manipulate that as much as I can with switching up my inspiration, switching up what I'm consuming that are hopefully going to, yeah. they will pour themselves because things will pour into your timeline, whether you intend it or not. And yeah. I would rather it be intentional than not. Yeah. No, that's just speaking back to where we started, like the intentionality and the purpose, right? Like you're being proactive about controlling your emotions into the direction essentially as you, you know, like, and maybe even doing that in the space where you're going to be editing, like, is that where yeah. you kind of curate all of these things is like at your desk so that maybe like whatever's going on outside those doors is its own thing. But once yeah. you're back here, it's like, this is where I've been curating this. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, having a space and curating the space is huge for me. Yeah. Um, you know, here at the post house, we each have our edit suites. We, the editors can set them up and deck, you know, decor them out however they see fit. Uh, but it's, it's, so it's twofold. It's having a space for me that is purely dedicated to cutting. I walk in here and I cut. Yeah. Uh, the whole room is set up to cut. I have a client couch, client monitor. My, you, I mean, it's just, this is where you edit. Yep. There's not much else you could do here. Yeah. Um, uh, but then also the second aspect is having my team and having the yeah. post house around. You know, I've worked with some of these people for, you know, eight, nine years here since I've, since I've been here. And so having, having the team here, whether we're collaborating on a project, literally on the same project, or just we're just like, in spiritual collaboration, like I've seen a ton of their cuts. They've seen a ton of my cuts. They can call me out if I'm doing the same thing over and over again, you know, yeah. having that. And then there's just something just totally different about having, and, and this is a very, you know, beaten path, but there's just something very different when somebody else enters the room and you play down a cut, yeah. you just all of a sudden see it in a totally new way. Yeah. And so just having quick access to people who understand what a rough cut is, understand yeah. a work in progress. There can be slugs, there can be holes in whatever, yeah. like there can be things. Um, and they either can speak into it or just don't even have to. Sometimes, they'll, you know, 
watch it down and I'm like, you don't need to say anything. I know everything I need to do. <laughs> yeah. And then just like I can get to work, you know. And so having yeah. a space and then having my consistent team yeah. um, here behind me, I'm behind them. Yeah. We're all trying to make work together and make better work together. And so, you know, that's 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 kind of how, you know, going back to other questions, like get in the mindset, be intentional. Um, you know, I think editing, like you can just edit as as a craftsperson, you can just, you know, you can be a bricklayer in that way and just like focus on the craft or you can be the architect yeah. and um, uh, of of the project. And also you have to be the bricklayer, right? right. So there's a yeah. two handed approach to to editing because you have to be an artist as well as, as a craftsperson. And so um, but but I think all of, you know, kind of pulling all the threads that we've been talking about together, it's, you know, to be an editor is definitely a lifestyle choice and everything can pour into your craft and into your art in ways that you don't really see yeah. manifesting it immediately, but they will over time. And yeah. so it's definitely a lifestyle. It's definitely a specific choice. It's definitely um, a particular choice for a certain subset of people who really love it and can excel in it and want to get better and grow their art and craft. Yeah, I think that's so important, man. And it, it's cool to see how proactive you are about just creating that space, like intentionally. And that that room that you're in right now is only for cutting and doing podcast interviews. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so one thing that you mentioned the other day whenever we got to chat for a little bit was documentaries are the editor's medium. Um, and I just kind of want to like dig into that for a little bit. Like how does having documentary chops help you, you know, approach other genres of of editing yeah. um, different genres of film. Yeah, I mean the if you're if you're cutting doc and you're collaborating with the director and the kind of the ways that we've been discussing, um, you know, documentary is definitely the editor's medium. It's where they wear the most hats. It's where they have the most purview over so many different areas of the film. Whether it's like putting in the temp score, working out graphic treatments ideating text treatments, cut, cutting the film, the aesthetic, the pace, yeah. all of these different nuances. And I, mean, I just even say like branding the film, you know, what does this feel like? What is the graphics? What, what do the graphics feel like? You know, the editor really sits shoulder to shoulder with the director in, a, in almost every single aspect. But then getting into the story, there's a lot of back and forth. And, and you know, there's there's a lot of doc cutters that are credited as writers as well and yeah. so there's a lot of that you know writing note carding outlining breaking the story identifying the characters pivoting all of the stuff that in scripted would have been done by the writer or in earlier states of the process and so you know i, I view doc as the heavy lift of the editor yeah. um and then it kind of can waterfall from there you know if you can lift 100 pounds surely you can lift 50 and you can cut a scripted or you can cut a commercial or you can cut yeah. all of these other things. But if you can lift 50 pounds, it's not a given. You can lift 100. And so having documentary as the starting point for myself brings forward a, a disposition in the editor where they can attack a project, any of those other projects, with um, creative chops, but also project managerial chops with being able to be the center of the post project and collaborate with the sound designer and mix and the color and you know because a lot of times the director spends the most time in the edit room not as much time in sound and not as much time in color and so for me the timeline kind of becomes the notepad of the director and then I can go into those rooms and be like this is what we were thinking about for the sound this is what we were thinking about for the color and so kind of becoming that almost creative project torch bearer yeah. to bring the director's spirit into the other rooms and to make sure this is fulfilling everything that we had discussed. And so, you know, it's, it's having that documentary mindset when you go into a 30 second commercial cutting room that can pay huge dividends and that it's just a, just a different way to approach it. Now you have to understand each one of these genres has different demands on the editor. There's a huge demand on the editor for a documentary, you know, and scripted feature. And then once you get into the commercial work, you know, it's like, are you there identifying why you're on the project? Are you there as a creative collaborator? Probably. Are you there as just like 
a cool collaborator to hang out with because it's a 30 second commercial about milk. It's like, cool. Like I'll work, I'll jam with the creative director and be a good hang and like yeah. play ping pong, whatever. And so you, <laughs> you also are identifying why you're yeah. on the project, but that's also a doc. I believe that's a doc mindset. You're, you have to identify why you're here yeah. and employ different parts of your craft, your art for the specific need. Yeah. And so, you know, having that doc mindset is huge for all of the other disciplines. Yeah. It's interesting how, I mean, the way you describe it, I just imagine like y- there's different versions of you as an editor, right? And, you know, different people get different, the different Lucas, you know, for different projects, right? So yeah, I think it, there's a lot of value in, in recognizing that, that like, hey, for this project, like you said, they're going to get, you know, this version of me and that's going to make this project better. That's going to make our relationship better. And that's going to make me maybe even not burn out on the next time I move on to yeah. something that, you know, needs totally. the other version of me and needs all of that version of me so that I'm not wasting it here. Um, so one thing I want to get into is something you mentioned on Monday that might ruffle a few feathers is, um, that editing is the most uniquely cinematic discipline. Um, I'd love for you to like, just flesh out that thought. I mean, you know, I could, I, I like, you know, ruffling feathers is fun. You could talk me into a couple other disciplines, but we're going to go with editing because I'm an editor. It's, you know, film is the juxtaposition between two shots. It, that, and that's, you know, you can be tricky and make it feel like a one take, fine, whatever. There's a <laughs> couple that do that and even less that do it well. But, um, you know, it the craft of editing is the craft of filmmaking. And everything is working towards the edit and towards the actual assembly of the film. Bringing in the visuals, bringing in the dialogue, the sound, the process of editing is the process of filmmaking until then it is all just raw materials and raw goods which are all important and they all need to be there and be done to be done and be done well in order to make a film and so i'm not saying that they're necessarily not film um in and of the film crafts in and of themselves but the unique position and the unique exploration of cutting from this angle to this angle to this angle and it being a cohesive story is not obvious that it would it was going to work and like you can go back and read these you know the pioneers of film and the pine who are also the pioneers of film editing and see their exploration into will this work you know it wasn't it wasn't obvious that it wouldn't be incredibly disorienting to cut from a wide shot to a tight shot of an actor um it the the process of film and the forward direction of film as uh, an art form has been in lockstep with the with the development uh, conceptually and also technologically of the edit. Yeah. And so it is the the culminating craft and art of film is the edit and the edit to bring all of these things together. And so you know for me it's like that's a very um, exciting and uh, daunting seat to sit in, but you know it's it is a lot of fun because it's the time when people you can pull the film out of theoretical and out of people's imaginations and start putting it on the timeline, and that can either be yeah. incredibly exciting or incredibly heartbreaking uh, for directors. Uh, but you know it is the it is the time and the place where the idea of a film starts to become the reality of the film. Yeah. I think it's it's fun to to be a part of that, you know, one of the final steps like you were just getting at too. We just had um, Mark Waters on on the podcast. He's a composer, conductor, and he's gotten to do a lot of film scores. And um, one thing that he mentioned was like whenever a, a director comes in and they get to watch their film with a score behind it, he's like sometimes their reaction is like they just saw their baby say, say their first words for the first time. And he's like, that's yeah. such a fun joy to get to like, watch their their dream come to fruition and i think the editors get a lot of that experience as well too i want to dig into a little bit and shed shed some light on just what it looks like to to do these things like what is what are the some processes that you use what are some tools that you use um and like let's kind of dig into the tangibles here um and specifically we can talk about this around uh, some specific projects and I, I i wanted to bring up the fact that you just actually had two films featured at uh South by Southwest, the lines of Mesopotamia and then Clemente. First, before we dig into the tangibles, I'd love to just know what your experience was like getting to, to live that, you know, uh, coming down to South by and watching your films on the big screen. 
It was awesome. It was it was a whirlwind. It was a, a lot of fun. So on Lions of Mesopotamia, I was the editor. Um, and then Elise Ander here, she was the story producer. Mm-hmm. And then Mark Bartels did sound design and mix. And then Clark Griffiths did the color. So we kind of had this whole post house around yeah. this project. Um, and like Ryan Bicknell was the online editor. and deli- So we, just, we were just all on it. And then for Clemente, um, Chent was the lead editor and he worked with Elise as well as a story producer. And then on that one, I was the supervising editor. Okay. And we also did color. So it was just like having these two films bouncing around the studio, bouncing around the post house was, was, was awesome. And so we, as the whole team, we went down to South by and got to be there for the premieres and it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, um, you know, surreal and, really fun to see it on the big screen really fun to have the q and a's yep. really fun to like walk around the festival and hear people talking about your film yeah. and that like you don't know who they are so it was just like a lot of like really unique and cool experiences for sure yeah what are some some tools that you guys use what are some processes that are in place to make sure that y'all can actually hit a deadline with two feature docs you know floating around yeah i mean a lot of moxie um there's just a lot of you know pulling together the team and making sure all of this stuff is having very broken down timelines and deadlines that we can achieve. And so it's having, you know, you know, people like Sunshine, who's our post supervisor and just like coming around it as a team and being like, what is the way that we're going to approach this? We're all hooked. I mean, nitty gritty. We're all hooked up on a on a server, shared server with like, I don't know, 650 terabytes. Uh, And so we're all like cutting off of that. We have our workstations. We have, everybody has their specific uh, discipline. And a big one for us is having Ryan, who's our online editor, like conform, get all this stuff in Resolve for the colorist to do their thing. But then we also deliver out of Resolve. Even though we cut in Premiere, we deliver out of Resolve. Uh, And so it's having that workflow, having a dedicated person who's ushering as archival shots come in, swap these shots, swap this shot. We got this unwatermarked. We got this VFX shot who's constantly doing that alongside the colorist. And so it's like building the team and having the team have the chops and the understanding of the goal uh, and also the steps along the way to the goal. And so... It really comes down to the people and then the tech is there to support the people. So we have, you know, our server and all of our workstations hooked up, all shared storage and stuff like that. So how long were y'all working on, on posts for those two projects? A couple of years, two, two and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it wasn't every single day. Right. It was, you know, get the footage, start cutting. There's usually that rush, not rush, but there's that first initial push to get a, you know, an assembly or a rough cut. Yep. Director comes, sits for a week or two weeks and work through and that would get it to what we call, you know, rough cut. Yeah. Um, that's the rough cut. I don't talk about rough cut until after the director's here because if you start presenting cuts as rough cuts, that's yeah, when right. you start freaking out. <laughs> but if you present them as assemblies, it's like, oh, okay, we can, we, okay, it's, oh, yeah. it's not a rough cut. Yeah, yeah. it's just an assembly. Yeah. Um, and so get it to the rough cut and then start the notes process. And then there's a lot of times it's just pencils down until we know what the next steps are, whether yeah. it's festival, distribution. What, and so the whole calendar was like two, two and a half years. Yeah. Um, but there were t- periods of, in and outs throughout yeah. um, that time. So I'm assuming y'all are working on other projects while you're also yeah. working on these. How do you get in and out of the that mindset? Because, you know, you're a pro, if you're working on a 30 second ad spot, like you're going to have to be in a wholly different mindset than whenever you're working on one of these feature docs. How do you go yeah. in and out of those things? You just do yeah. <laughs> like you just have to. Yeah. Okay. And that's kind of the way that the post house is how I've set up the post house is if yeah. we are going to get the opportunities to do these features and these original content, these films, um, then you have to be willing and okay with and diligent about changing your mindset. So everybody can do it differently, whatever. But the reality is, is like you're on a film today and tomorrow you're on a dog food commercial. Yeah. Like that's just the way it is. And so you have to get yourself in the mindset. Yeah. Um, and so in some ways that's just the work of an editor, yeah. maybe in general, but definitely specifically here. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you just kind of keep things, keep things in perspective and 
keep the ball moving forward. I always like step out of a feature timeline with the next two or three things that I know I need to jump into and start so I can start quick. Yeah. I don't want to like get to a, some kind of level of completion. And then I open it up and like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Like I open up my timelines and I have a hundred things I need to do. Yeah. And then that gets the ball rolling. Yeah. Some of them are, you know, technical things, clean up, you know, work on some little audio transitions, whatever. And then some yeah. of them are, are more creative. And so I can dive into the nitty gritty, get me back into the flow of the yeah. film and then get to the creative. Yeah. And so, you know, it's always leaving, leaving uh, little strings to clean up on my features so that I can get back into them seamlessly. And so, you know, it's, but that's also the pivot. I think it's the pivot in and out of these genres that kind of keep stuff fresh. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, you know, if you if you're if you cut your dream project every single day for the rest of your life, you'll burn out. Yep. Just as I, I would I would wager a bet to say probably just as quickly if you cut, you know, stuff you were not super hype about for the rest of your life, you'd probably burn out at roughly the same time. Yep. And so it's like the the mixture and kind of that oscillation between different genres of cutting that I think really keeps stuff fresh. At least it does for me. I like I really love stepping out of features and going into advertisement and stepping out of advertisement and going back to fe- what I like yeah. I really like going in and out because I love them both for different reasons. Yeah. And so it gets a lot of fun. Sometimes it can get a little hectic, but yeah. Such is life. <laughs> is there like any specific way that you um, keep track of where your mind was whenever you're stepping away and then coming back like um, some kind of note taking or? Yeah, I mean, I take notes, just handwritten notes on a notepad that I always have here. And then yeah. I use like a little extension called Post Notes. Okay, That's just like a notepad that can directly connect to a timeline. And so my like in, it's within Premiere. And so then I can just pull up that timeline in Post Notes and just jot myself down couple to do's or yeah. uh, this is what I was thinking where the next steps would be. So it's kind of both. I mean, a lot of, of what you just answered revolves around the collaboration with your, with your whole team. Um, if you were just a one man band doing one yeah. of these projects, like what, what would you think would be like some of the top, top tools or processes that you would have to adhere to that you would want someone else that's maybe doing what you're doing, but without, you know, that support um, to kind of lean into. I mean, I would, it's kind of cop out, but I'd be like, get a community. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. I mean, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can work in your basement or whatever. You can do it however you want to do it. I'm not saying there's one way to edit, yeah. but I do think that I know that filmmaking is a communal yeah. effort. So if you're not bumping into them on the daily physically, like in a space together, I would definitely find some kind of cohort creative collaborator whether they're other editors whether they're just people that have great sensibilities whether yeah. you know whatever like i would definitely find that because you know my cuts are 50 percent what they would be if i didn't have my people yeah. um and so it's just like don't do that would probably be my <laughs> okay. biggest thing uh, no that's yeah. i mean you say it's a cop out but i think that's really important and especially now like if you're living like in the middle of nowhere but this is your passion like you can connect with people online yeah, totally. and, and build that community where you yeah absolutely get to share that experience and um and you can get feedback, the so. you know y- you know we're in St. Louis um and we it's our goal and our intention to get the projects that we want to get whether they're these features that go to South by whether they're you know we start on a doc series for one of the major streamers in in the next month so there's like really exciting projects that we're getting looks at and so but you just have to be intentional about it too. So if you're in the middle of nowhere, it not only is possible to find a creative community that you can um, rely and trust to be that, you know, voice into your art, but you can also get the projects that you want to get, but you just have to be intentional about them both. Yeah. And I, you know, you also have to be intentional if you're in New York and LA, it's a different kind of intention, yeah. but it all comes back to intentionality. Um, and just not letting your career happen to you, but like you making it be the thing you want it to be. Well, it's been a pleasure getting to chat with you today, Lucas. Um, man, I love like how intentional you are um, and like how disciplined you are with that intentionality. So cool. yeah. thanks for sharing all that today. Um, and for those who are listening, Absolutely. like where can, how can they find you online? Just Google. Uh, <laughs> it kind of pops up my website, which is lucasjharger.com. Um, okay. This post house, which is brutonstroby.com slash outpost. Um, I'm on Instagram mostly, okay. though infrequently. It's definitely where I am the most. Um, and that's where you can 
see my timelines. <laughs> it's yeah, pretty okay. much all that I post anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, those those are the places. And then I mean, email, contact form, whatever. I'm I'm on email a lot. Cool. Um, and in Instagram DMs, and so that's where that's where I hang. Sweet. And we'll link all that in the show notes as well. Um, for lines of Mesopotamia and Clemente, when is there like a public release date for any of those yet? Or are they still just kind of doing the festival circuit or? Yeah. Hybrid between festival, but predominantly looking for distribution. And so they're each in kind of sales (laughs) mode, especially after South by, which kind of, you know, puts a feather in the cap and helps, you know, um, that those efforts. And so hopefully in the next couple few months, we'll have either them out or some like very definitive word. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll link, um, the landing pages for those as well in the show notes, but Lucas, thanks again for for joining us today. Um, man, I, I hope we can you know do this again maybe sometime in the, yeah, in the future. Absolutely. So. Totally. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to, there's a lot more we could talk about. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's it for today's episode of The Rough Draft. To learn more about our guests and to find links and resources related to the conversation, check out rev.com slash podcasts. Be sure to rate and subscribe in order to stay up to date with the latest episodes and help other creatives find us. Thank you for listening and we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of The Rough Draft.